Hello, I'm Kamla. My guest today is Corbett Redford. He's a filmmaker and musician. His debut documentary is called Turn It Around, The Story of East Bay Punk. Here's a clip from the film and then our interview with Corbett Redford. To those who live it, punk rock is something more. It is a conversation with society. San Francisco, I think at one point, is probably the strongest scene in America. All of a sudden, like, all these bands just start popping out. The bands that we were excited about were our East Bay bands. It had an important place in the pantheon of punk. It was about playing honest music. Like, it wasn't hard like, like punk rock was supposed to be. It wasn't always about the band that was playing on stage. It was equally about what was happening in the audience. Punk Rock Club opened up in my neighborhood. I jumped on a bus the next day and I headed back home. People remember it as being a starting point to the East Bay scene. Gilman Street, you had a co-op. You didn't have any of that in LA. Nobody trusted anybody. It was a great hub for all the bands to go to. This was what was going to be it for another generation. Silly string everywhere in the room. It was just a lot of mocking and I was just like, this place sounds pretty rad. <laughs> Punk was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's an underground punk scene. It's meant to thrive in this environment. You know, when I stopped to think about it now, it was a precious time. Looking back upon my life and the place. People can create their own culture. You don't have to wait. You can say, hey, I got something to say and only say it. It ended up revitalizing a scene and, and keeping something alive. Punk rock isn't a sound. It's doing something you're afraid of doing. That's the East Bay sound. Turn it around, the story of East Bay punk. So, welcome to the show, Cobbert. Thank you for having me, Kamala. So we just saw that clip from your film. And the line that caught me, caught my attention was, Punk rock is a conversation with society. That's not the thought that comes to one's mind when you think of punk rock. I think punk rock, when it started, had a, kind of a political base. Mm. And so there was a lot of, uh, you know, questioning of authority in the lyrics and, the, you know, the powers that be. And that's still there. Uh, I think it's a way to communicate. Uh, the other part of that statement in our film is that it's a conversation with society. And often it's an argument. That's what I was looking for the word argument because conversation <laughs> means it, there's give and take on both sides. Right. Whereas argument means you're shouting at me and I just have to listen, right? <laughs> so that's why I was uh, kind of taken aback pleasantly so sure, sure. that it's a conversation with society. So what, what drew you to make this film? I think that uh, the East Bay punk rock scene had a big effect on me. Uh, as a young man, I came from Contra Costa County, where there's no universities. You know, where our parents aren't professors or artists. Our parents are, you know, waitresses and refinery workers. And when I uh, wound up going out to the 94 Gilman Street project, it gave which me is in of, Berkeley. It's in Berkeley. Yeah, it, it gave me kind of a sorely uh, needed education on how to potentially be a more thoughtful citizen of the world, uh, treating people who are different than me. Uh, you know, with, you know, on equal terms, you know, uh, questioning, you know, wh where I spend my money, you know, uh, based on the ethics of the business involved. Uh, so, yeah, so it, 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 that scene had a big effect on me. And it molded you as a human being. It absolutely did. And it had an effect on uh, the people in Green Day as well. Uh, it it uh, helped make them who they are today. And Green Day uh, are the people, uh, is the band behind this film? They are the executive producers of Turn It Around. Okay. So you knew the folks of Green Day right from your high school days? I did. Yeah. yeah. Before we go there, Contra Costa County, uh, as I found out, means the opposite county. <laughs> <laughs> and it is opposite to San Francisco. Yes. So you are basically cut off because you are on the northern edge of Berkeley. Yeah. It's it's farther north, I guess, mm -hmm. or, or in West Contra Costa. There's no BART that goes there. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, music clubs where kids can just kind of freely express themselves. So if you wanted to go and learn and create 
um, you, you had to get to Berkeley. And so getting there was often hard for kids in Contra Costa County. They'd have to take their you know, skateboard down San Pablo Avenue, or anything they could to get out to uh, to see the great greater world, I guess. So there was no transport that connected them? No direct transport. But then BART came and it changed things. Well, BART is still actually not connected to the furthest west Contra Costa County, like Rodeo, Pinole, El Sobrante, Crockett, Port Costa, these band or th these band, these cities, uh, they they are still in some sense. There's a it's a maze to get to these ca uh, catalysts of culture. These other cities finding a way from the cities in West Contra Costa County to places like Berkeley or San Francisco is kind of a complicated maze of of transportation. Uh, there's no easy access to uh, to culture. Mm -hmm. So you knew the folks of Green Day from your high school days. I did. Uh, and tell us this, an incident that I read where one of the Green Day members actually helped you and that's how you kind of became, I guess, good friends with them in, in a sense. Uh, how I met uh, the bass player, uh, Mike Durnt. Uh, I was a freshman in high school, it was my first day of school, and Mike was a senior at the time. Uh, high school was very uh, daunting for me. I, I, my first day I was very scared and kind of nervous. Why? I was an awkward kid. I was, I was, a, I was, uh, you know, I kind of came from, you know, a difficult background, and uh, so I was very emotional that day. And I got out of uh, PE, which was, you know, as kind of a, you know, an awkward kid was a very hard thing to do. And at the end of it, uh, these two kids came up to me and they took my backpack and they threw it under the bleachers. So I just, I think I had had such a a bad day overall that I just was sobbing relentlessly. I just broke, you know. And uh, the bass player of Green Day, Mike, came up to me and said, what's, what's going on, man? And I said, you know, through my tears, you know, these guys, they threw my backpack under the bleachers. And he says, I'm skinny, I can go in there and I can get it. And he got it for me. And uh, that was how I met him. And he, he, you know, he helped me out on that day. Uh, so. From that point on, uh, as they kind of went out into the world and, and, you know, they were this kind of beacon of if you did the work and you, you know, dedicated yourself to creativity, you might be able to get out of that town that doesn't understand you, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've always been supportive of my creative endeavors and I thank them for it. So Dunt and uh, Billy Joe, I guess, mm -hmm. um, met each other when they were like 10 years old or something. Yeah. And the first band was called Sweet Kids. Uh, Sweet, Children was, Sweet Children was one of their early bands. Uh, our film actually talks about a, a, a band they had called Desecrated Youth. Okay. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, and then they went from Desecrated Youth to Sweet Children. You know? okay. The reason I bring that up is the gesture that uh, the, the kindness that you offered yes. reflects the name of the band. Absolutely. Sweet Children. So how did these Sweet Children become punk rock stars? <laughs> Uh, Which is, uh, again, you know, uh, for mo most of us don't associate sure. punk with uh, kindness. And and I don't know why that is, but maybe you can help. And by watching this very dense film, mm -hmm. I came to understand that kindness was one of the cornerstones of whatever Green Day did or whatever you all did at Gilman. Right. How did that seep into your thinking? It might have something to do with Berkeley and mm -hmm. the acceptance of Berkeley. Uh, the idea that, uh, well, Tim Yohannan, who was kind of a, a left-wing intellectual, you know, from the East Coast, came over. He had uh, a lot of practice in collectivism and in, you know, building community. And he decided that, that he wanted Gilman to be an antidote to what was happening in the punk scene uh, in the 70s and the 80s, which was, you know, promoters ripping off kids. There was corruption. Uh, there was drugs and alcohol, which led to violence. Uh, there was the rise of the nationalist skinhead culture. Uh, the kind of racist stuff was 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 coming into these shows, where really uh, what punk and music should be in the uh, in the first place is just a place to to express yourself, right? To say what you want to say and and say it with the energy that you want to say it. But when these other kind of bad dynamics started coming in, uh, Johannan says, "I want to create a place that none of that is allowed." And he founded uh, Gilman. And he founded 94 Gilman. Okay. Uh, and when Green Day, who was from Contra Costa County, where there were you know, no places to express yourself, it just was kind of kismet that they happened to find this place and find a home and a platform for their voice. Okay. So tell us, 
how many years did you spend making this film and how many hours and how did you manage to get, what, 150 interviews? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, 185 interviews for oh. 500 hours of interview footage, 35,000 photos and flyers, and over 500 video clips. I've spent the last four years of my life working on the film. Every day? Every day, every week. Um, you know, when you're doing something like this where you're trying to condense or distill 30 years of culture, there's a lot of people, not just the, you know, the people you interview, but, uh, you know, the people who have the photos and, you know, the archivists and these people. So I became kind of densely connected to thousands of people over the course of this whole thing where, uh, you know, and this is a sacred history to many. So I tried to be uh, compassionate and available uh, to as many people as I could. And, uh, I thank my wife <laughs> and my son <laughs> for uh, being understanding, <laughs> you know, but... Uh, so can I ask you yeah. if there was a work-life balance uh, dilemma going on for these four years? It was very, it was very hard. You know, I turned 40 and became a new father during the course of this production. And uh, so I had to try to find that balance, you know. Uh, this is also kind of the biggest canon I've ever been shot through. And this is, you know, Green Day has got it distributed in, in theaters everywhere. and. Uh, you know, doing wonderful, you know, appearances like this. And so I, you know, it, it's been, there's been, it's been difficult, but thankfully I have a supportive wife and my son will know when to tell me, uh, daddy, no work now, be daddy now. And oh, so, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So you taught him well. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. And uh, what he says goes. It's his world. We just live in it. So. Okay. So I understand that when uh, Green Day gave the green signal for you to make the film, there were like a couple of rules, ground rules they laid out. What were those? So the, I, there were these friendly guidelines. They were really, as far as the narrative and the production, they, I think, trusted me as a storyteller to just kind of go with it. Uh, but initially, Billy said, well, why, why don't we think like this? Um, don't get lost in the acrimony and the backbiting, because if you focus on that too much, you can kind of get mired in it. So that was the first one. Uh, don't mystify nostalgia uh, to the point that you might convince somebody that they missed some legendary train that they could never recreate. Let's inspire people to try to build something just as fun and inclusive and positive now. Uh, and the third was uh, diverse voices. Let's not just have uh, all white dudes. Let's, you know, let, of course, there's a, a lot of us who, you know, helped create that scene. But there were many other uh, folk, people of color, LGBT, IQ folks, uh, so many different kinds of people who made that early scene special. So uh, those were the three ground rules, and I was uh, very grateful to, to follow those. Again, it looks like Berkeley has had a huge influence in the way you think. Right, yeah. That is yeah. be inclusive and, you know. Absolutely. Uh, but what I liked is that don't uh, feel, don't make people feel that they lost out on an opportunity. Right. It, you, you can create something just as special now. Uh, you know, if, if you're inspired by the past, don't put it beyond yourself to be able to create that with those around you again or something even better than that. Okay. Where did Green Day... Uh, developed this ethos of hard work because they worked very hard to achieve uh, their success. I think that they all had, uh, you know, mothers and fathers who were, you know, truckers and waiters and working class folks. Um, you know, so there was that idea that if you're going to be a creative in the world, that you want to apply that work ethic, that working class kind of blue collar thing to your band. Or if you're a painter, you know, apply that to that, you know. Uh, so, you know, there was also kind of glimpses of that in, I think, bands like The Clash, you know, uh, the, the early English punk band. Uh, but they, they certainly, it was, it was an easy way for them to, you know, a lot of people, when you make these choices in life, you know, I want to be a creative and I want to do this, your parents are like, oh no, this is such a gamble. Like, you know, it's a lottery to be able to succeed doing something like this. Um, but they didn't give up, and they worked, and they worked, and they didn't wait for their audience to come find them. Um, it they was, went uh, seeking They went seeking their audience. their audience. They would play, uh, in our film, it, it shows that they are, they're one of their uh, tour promoters says, well, so what do you want to do? Like, is there, what's the guarantee on these shows? And they said, we'll play anywhere. Are there people there that want to see us? Uh, no money, no, but, you know, just, we'll just play. Why? Because... The way I look at it is like I've even been in, in, a, in a satiric folk band that's toured the nation. And uh, so we're going to Gainesville, Florida. 
and we can't get a club show that day, say maybe 10 years ago or something. And this excited kid says, hey, uh, I've got 50 kids uh, at my house who want to see your band. Will you come play? And I say, okay, well, I'm out here because I want to share my music. And uh, I want you know, people to be excited about it and to see it. And uh, so I go play that house show. And what, 10 years later, maybe, maybe 30 or more of those people who saw us that day, who we perform well for, will still come out to my shows. Or they'll still, it's kind of the way people look at small business in a sense. Sure, your time is valuable, but so is the time of others. <laughs> you know? Very so, true, very so, true. So it, I think it's about... Uh, it, respect goes both ways. Absolutely, find your audience. Okay. You know, don't wait for them to necessarily find you. So the, the, the punk uh, music scene has this do-it-yourself uh, ethos. Absolutely. And I think your film is also a reflection of that because you didn't train as a filmmaker oh. <laughs> or, or, you know, you didn't, you, this was your first film. It was, yeah. It when is. you look back, did you have any misgivings that the film may not work out or were you just convinced that you could make it happen? I mean, distilling 30 years of history, there were times when I thought, how can we do this? You know, there are so many, uh, history is subjective, right? And I would tell anybody that consider our film a primer. Mm. Uh, you know, nothing is, is definitive. Everybody remembers things differently. Uh, but what I knew is I had a responsibility uh, to do the best job that I could with everyone's sacred stories and, and memories uh, and art and music. And so there, there were times where I thought, this is impossible. You know, how can I do this? You know, but my story editors and my editor and my you know co-writer and our entire crew, uh, we did it. We it uh, four years later we did it. Mm. Who are some of the punk uh, uh, bands from the East Bay that we may not be aware of? Green Day is one of them. Sure, uh, Rancid, Operation Ivy, uh, Isocracy, Crimp Shrine, um, Kamala and the Carnivores. Uh, Spit Boy, uh, there's so many. Uh, that's something about our film is it shows the kind of the dense nature of how these things happen. That and was very surprising to see how many <laughs> bands there were. There's even more. You know, it's it's not uh, you know California exceptionalism that I say this, but our area, it's so dense. Mm. The towns are so close together, and there's something happening in each of those towns, and uh, you know, and it's still happening today. You know, it. it uh, <laughs> I think there, and that, you know, our film covers 30 years. I bet you there were over 500 bands that, that came and went during that entire time. So, um, there was, uh, the, one of the first uh, drummers for Green Day was Raj Punjabi. Yes. I'm wondering, did you have him in the film? Yes. You did? Okay. I was, yeah, I think you had him in maybe one or two shots. Yeah, well, he, if, if you watch the film, he wasn't actually the the first drummer. He was... Uh, a guy who he would drum with them sometimes. I think he, you know, he was working for his family's business. Uh, he, I, as as he told us, he was sometimes reluctant at the nature of these early gigs. You know, why would I be playing a backyard? Why would I? Is this worth? Is this worth my time? So uh, they weren't called Green Day, and they weren't even called Sweet Children at that point. Uh, he would he would he was their interim guy, and uh, I think actually one thing that we don't. Uh, mentioned in the film is that during that show they play in the backyard when he left and their their drummer from within the scene came up uh, he actually left because he didn't like the show and left his drum set behind and so it, you know <laughs> it's uh yeah it, it, they they went on to continue to make music you know in, in, into the world so uh, but I'm, I'm happy to have him in the film now, Green Day is uh, turning out to be a very interesting business uh, group, or I don't know what is the right word to use, because they, they have started a Oakland coffee shop. Yep. And uh, then, diners and coffee shops. And, uh, and a studio. Uh, Jingletown Studio. I think it just, it just closed. But okay. they, it was there for, for, geez, almost two decades, I think. Uh, but yeah, they, I think they, uh, they're the kind of guys who, who don't rest on their laurels. They always want to be busy. Uh, if they have a creative idea, they want to follow through with it. And they want to be ambitious and work hard. So I think they continue to, to uh, you know, follow, follow their hearts and minds and, and, uh, and try new things. 
What has uh, the making of this film taught you? Wow, I think it's taught me uh, to meter uh, the kinds of creative projects that I take on. This was a, you know, a, a heavy endeavor, you know, and uh, that, I mean, I think on a production level, uh, I'm looking forward to potentially doing a single narrative film in the future, <laughs> you know, where maybe we focus on one band, you know. Uh, that, so you so, want to do music-related documentaries? I, I would absolutely do music-related documentaries or narrative films or, or live-action films. Uh, uh, I will continue to make music and, and, uh, and write and, and make other art as well. Um, I think overall, too, it, 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 you know, as a person, what I learned during the course of this is that uh, in spite of the kind of weight of the world or, or people kind of telling you that you need to uh, have permission to be what you want to be, uh, you can, if you put in the work and, and, you, and you're stalwart about, about your vision of who you, uh, the path you'd like to take, you can do it. And you can find, uh, uh, you know, similarly minded other, uh, you know, if, you can find others like yourself, uh, even though they might be very different, and you can build something positive. So uh, hearing these stories, you know, inspired me to kind of continue forward and, try, and to try to create something uh, good in the world. What has been the feedback that you got about the film? Because for me, when I watched the film, it was very surprising. I didn't know about this history. Yeah. You know? It's, I mean, so far, um, you know, the, the, the people that we made the history about, uh, we're getting a lot of love back. Um, you know, that we wanted to tell the story right. And uh, the people who, who lived that story are telling us that we did, which is very nice. Uh, people who don't have you know, maybe the, the, the knowledge of, of the theme of our film uh, are, are leaving saying that they laughed and they learned things and that, uh, you know, they, they might be inspired to go start a band themselves even though they don't know how to play. They're willing to, to learn and, uh, and that's very nice. So that brings back uh, full circle to something that I read uh, in preparation for the interview that somebody said, this is a god, this is a god, go form a band. <laughs> so I guess that's what your film is telling people, that you can play music if you want to. Well, you know, when I was a kid, I, I, I acted a lot. And I, um, I loved Robin Williams. Oh. And, and uh, I, was, I went to see a play one night with my girlfriend, and I got up to go get a uh, program. And he was sitting there in the aisle seat. And she and I had, my girlfriend and I had just been having a, a conversation about about how, how if we could meet anyone who we want to meet, and it was Robin Williams, who I said to her. So then suddenly he was sitting there, and when I saw him, you know, he's this on the the big screen. He's this mystified thing, or just like rock stars on the big stage. There's this mystified idea. But when I saw him, you know, he didn't have those Popeye forearms. He was he seemed a bit gentle and wispy. And my point in saying this is that uh, don't let these kind of larger than life figures make you feel that you could escape, you know, that, that that kind of life or that kind of presence would escape you. You know, it, it, it's uh, dream big and don't be afraid. Uh, I know it's hard. <laughs> Who taught you to dream big? <sighs> Who taught me to dream big? My grandfather. Not uh, Green Day? Green Day, yes. And yes, let me, let me, <laughs> let me change that. Uh, no, don't change it, your grandfather. Well, uh, both of them. Uh, I would be, my grandfather uh, told me that nothing was out of my reach. And Green Day. What did he do? Uh, he was an iron worker. He was a kid from uh, the Depression in Indiana who uh, joined the army when he was 14 in order to help like, feed his brother and then you know, came out to California on the rails and, and, uh, and couldn't read but wound up becoming one of the architects on the Transamerica building. And, really? Know, he was an iron worker, yeah. He, he, uh, so, so you have pictures of your grandfather? I do, yeah, and myself. I I, I could make sure to, to give yeah. you some of them, uh, but but also with, too, with him within the uh, the Trans America Pyramid. Uh, you know, that's my my father is telling me as an archivist you should find this, uh, but I don't have those. No. Okay. He was on television uh, during the ribbon cutting ceremony, according to my family. Okay. Uh, so I hope to find that one day, but uh, then also too, as a suburban kid who kind of felt you know trapped and misunderstood, Green Day was this this. Rocket, there's this beacon of of hope that if you put in the work and you dream big, you could go out there and you could you could find your place in the world. And I would not be a creative today uh, if not for that band. They really set my heart and uh, 
you know, they were the, they, it was, when I was a kid, I think uh, when I was a teenager, I was noted to have like only Green Day shirts, you know? So I was, I grew up the biggest fan of this band. They were, they were a big deal in our town uh, prior to the, the world. So do you have all those old t-shirts? I don't. I have pictures of me in those old t-shirts. Yeah. Okay. Um, where do you live now? I live in Pinole, California. You still live in Pinole? I do. I lived in Oakland for 15 years, uh, making art and music. And uh, my wife and I were looking to buy a home. And she said, you know, what about Pinole? I'm like, I kind of ran away from there scream screaming, you know. Uh, and, she, and then I realized kind of anywhere is what you make it. And uh, going back there, there's a lot of wonderful people. Uh, so, is it still the same Pinole? Has it changed? Well, when I was a teenager, there was uh, this experiment that was going on that the mayor at the time was was uh, ejected due to racist comments, and uh, they they put cameras on every corner in the in the town. It was like, and so as a kid, you're like, you know, this is 1984. Realized, you know, what is going on here? You know, and you're <laughs> Big and, Brother's watching. Yeah, and you kind of you're you know, got this chip on your shoulder, you know. Um, but so, but no, it, it's, it's a great place to raise a kid and it's a great place to, uh, it's very quiet, you know, and, uh, I, I, I love my hometown in spite of my, my rocky relationship with it. Corbett, thank you so much for stopping by and talking to us. Kamala, thank you for having me. Oh, you were listening to Corbett talk about his film, Turn It Around, the story of East Bay Punk. It's a very densely made film and it gives you the history of uh, the punk music and musicians from the San Francisco Bay Area, but especially from the East Bay, which is on the other side of San Francisco. If you missed any of our shows, you can watch them on our YouTube channel. And we thank you for tuning in and watching our show. Until next time, goodbye.